Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Daiwa Foundation. My name is Jason James. So, uh, this evening, we're looking back at Britain, Japan, and Pearl Harbor. Um, and our main speaker is Dr. Anthony Best. Um, but I'm going to leave our chair to introduce him, and I'll just uh, very briefly introduce Professor Ian Nish, who's our chair this evening. And I'm sure he needs no introduction to a lot of you. Um, he's one of the leading uh, Japanese historians in this country and he's Professor Emeritus of International History at LSE, uh, where he worked from 1962 to 1991, and he's published a number of books, um, particularly about Japan's foreign relations, uh, relations with China, and about the uh, Anglo-Japanese uh, alliance uh, at the start of last century. So, Ian, I'll hand over to you. Dr. Anthony Best has taught the history of Japan within the general uh, uh, range of international and transnational context now for 25 years. Yeah. He's also a productive author and has published standard works on Anglo-Japanese relations um, down to the fall of Singapore and his most recent project takes that on to the 1975. I can't think what happened in 1975. It was the year, year of the oil crisis, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, we would doubtless hear more about that and, and on. So he is, in fact, the acknowledged expert on the Foreign Office files on the Anglo-Japanese relations at the National Archives at Kew. I need not tell a distinguished audience like this that the, the, the meeting notice is quite right. It said, it is rare for a historian to get the chance to engage in critical reflection of his own work. As, as you all know, what generally happens is that after a, a work is published, uh, the author will set aside one copy, mark it, author's copy, and we'll go through it, marking up partly the mistakes he's made, the, the dates that he has got wrong, and also the publisher's misprints. Um, but then the happy day comes, or may not come, but let us hope it comes, when the publisher says, your book is entirely out of print, and a, a reprint is needed. And, ah! says the author, this is the moment when I can correct all my mistakes. Uh, he, he therefore agrees to the contract and he says, now I have a certain number of corrections that I'd like you to make in the, in the manuscript. And the publisher says, no, really we're interested in reprinting the original version. These are the pearls that your readers want. Uh, how can the author refuse? So, we are lucky today to hear the contents of Dr. Anthony Best's bottom drawer, uh, where he's got the author's copy of uh, his original work, published, I think, in 1993. Uh, and he's going to reflect on that, bearing in mind the new files which have come, uh, become available since he originally wrote, mainly in the field of intelligence, and also changes in historiography, particularly concentrating less on internet or less on diplomatic history, and focusing more on uh, what is now called transnational history, which he's going to explain to us. I invite Anthony, therefore, to give us his reflections. Yeah, what does the original look like, if you haven't seen it? There it is. Um, name spelt correctly, no H in it. Um, quite rare with Routledge, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, occasionally they get it right. Um, and a nice snazzy cover. I, I got the cover because it had Pearl Harbor in it. 
Um, they told me this at the time. If it had been just Britain and didn't have Pearl Harbor, it would have been a sort of a, and the normal route with grey cover. Pearl Harbor uh, was supposed to boost sales. Um, the book was published in July of 1995. It's therefore 18 and a half years old and is allowed to drink, marry, and vote. Um, it was a much expanded version of the PhD um, that I worked on under Ian's supervision between 1986 and 1992. Yes, PhD students, I took six years um, to do it, not four, but there again, um, I had a job, um, so that's my excuse. The PhD um, was focused on the diplomacy of Sir Robert Craigie, British ambassador to Japan between 1937 and 1941, and uh, Shigemitsu Mamoru, who was the ambassador to London between 1938 and 1941. The thesis looked at the efforts made by these two diplomats to avoid hostility and to explain why their efforts have failed. And naturally, when you have a thesis which is concentrated on two people that nobody's ever heard of, it's pretty difficult to sell that to a publisher as a monograph. So it was clear that I'd have to do something different to get published. And that led on to this broader study, uh, Britain, Japan, and Pearl Harbor, avoiding war in East Asia, 1936, I'll explain 36 in a moment, to 41. Now clearly, in a way, this was um, difficult because I was not the first person to walk along this path by any means. Um, Bradford Lee, um, William Roger Lewis in the early 70s have produced studies that had tackled this period. But in particular, the late Peter Lowe, um, who was the uh, external examiner of my PhD, had written a book exactly on 1937 to 1941. Um, so many of the issues had already been covered, and I had to think what I could say that was original. Um, about the topic. Um, and I thought the originality came in two ways. One was sources, and the other was interpretation. Um, so when Peter had produced uh, his excellent book in the late 1970s, he was using the original FO371 general correspondence of the Foreign Office material, um, which had just been released. But in the late 1980s and early 1990s, some new records emerged, especially from the War Office and the Admiralty. Um, and uh, so these were sources that Peter hadn't been able to um, consult. In addition, um, both within these and with some other new releases, particularly in the Cabinet files, um, there was the first real public acknowledgement of Britain's intelligence gathering capability in East Asia during these years. Um, that focused on two things. Firstly, the release of CAB 81, which were the Joint Intelligence Committee papers. So I could look at those from its original founding um, in 1936 up to 1941. Um, but the most tantalizing aspect of this was BJ's and BJ's are the secret of my um, any success I have as a historian. BJ's refers to blue jackets. Um, in the Foreign Office, when documents come in, they be put into a folder. Most documents go into a folder with no stripe at all along the top. Some documents come in and they're given a green stripe, which means they're confidential, their circulation must be restricted. What you never see in the files which have been released under FO371 are folders with a blue stripe across the top. Because a blue stripe indicates that inside it is a decrypted telegram from a foreign power. Um, the blue jackets do not appear in the 1980s, but quite clearly there were references to them emerging in particular in the War Office files, and if you knew what you were looking for, you could also see references to them in the Foreign Office correspondence. And what you were looking for 
if you're still interested in following this trail, is a six-digit number. You search for a six-digit number beginning with zero, you've got a BJ. Um, and so that was an extremely important development, which meant I had something to new, new to say about the topic. Um, that I could talk about the degree to which the input of signals intelligence made a difference to how Britain perceived Japan. What happens when you can read the other side's mail? Um, more broadly, awareness, greater awareness of intelligence meant that uh, I could dismiss the very contemporary debate that had emerged about whether Churchill knew about the forthcoming attack on Pearl Harbor, a case made by Alan Rusbridger um, in the book he'd written with a former intelligence um, official um, named Nave, Eric Nave. And I was able to show, I think convincingly, although some people still aren't convinced, um, there was nothing to this story whatsoever. Um, this was, however, only a partial advance in the intelligence field. Um, following the book's publication, the Watergrave Initiative in the mid-90s transformed intelligence history completely. And that is what in turn led to my second book, um, which dealt with British intelligence in Japan from 1914 um, to 1941. And there I had actually the, uh, the transcripts of all the BJs um, from 1919 to 1941, and I went through every single volume of those. Fascinating period of my life. Um, I also traced back that in fact then BJs had begun to be uh, translated by the British during the First World War. It's from 1916 that Britain is decrypting this material. So one thing that I could do was to put intelligence into the picture. Um, but in a way, it was the interpretation that I found the most interesting aspect of this. Um, there was much more, I think, in my book on British economic relations with Japan um, than in Peter's work and the other works that come before it. Um, in part, now this is something I guess which is interesting if you're, inter if you're interested in sort of the methodology of writing history and how historians are interested by contemporary affairs. I was, and I'm quite conscious of this, I was influenced by the debates about international trade in the early 90s as globalization began. Um, I became interested in how trade fiction, trade friction, not trade fiction, um, trade friction could harm international relations. I remember in particular being struck by um, a panorama program that took place, I think, only a few weeks before the Earth Summit met in Rio in 1992. Um, and in that program, um, it had um, Prime Minister Mahathir of Malaysia making a strident case against the West imposing its economic model and its values on um, the less developed world. And if you know about this period, you may know that Matahir was the one who uh, would say later on in 1997 he wanted nothing to do with the IMF coming to help uh, Malaysia. Um, and uh, a rather strident rejection of globalization. And I thought that was interesting. Um, and that made me think back um, when I was going through the archives to look at the trade friction between Britain and Japan. But not just that, the ways in which people try to ameliorate that tension. Um, it's the beginning of a long-standing interest, but this is when it begun. Now what I found in the archives, and this is why the book begins in 36, is that in 1936, you can begin to see um, arguments made by the economic section of the Foreign Office um, about the need to address the issue that the world is divided into haves and have nots. And that if Britain and other status quo nations don't address this problem, they're actually creating long-term difficulties. In addition, this year, uh, 1936, saw Britain begin to prepare for a League of Nations Raw Materials Commission that met to consider um, whether greater access to raw materials in the colonies um, could be provided to the have-not nations. 
So I was very interested and struck by this, that there were these efforts to deal with these problems, and yet they seem to have disappeared from the history. Um, and I also wanted to know why they failed. And why they failed was that they came up against politics. Who, after all, in 1937, was going to say to a British elector, I've decided that uh, we're going to uh, allow the Japanese to trade more equally with the British Empire, and your textile factory is going to go uh, out of business, you're going to be made redundant and vote for me. It's not exactly the most persuasive electoral message you could imagine. Um, so that's why it was beginning in 36. I thought it was important to set the stage before July 1937 um, and to see how there were attempts to reach out in that period and then how obstacles emerged even before July 1937 and then see how they were enhanced over time. The sensitivity to this issue, as well as my early work on Craigie and Shigemitsu, also meant that I was extremely interested in the area of economic sanctions. I was struck that the Foreign Office very early on focused on Japan's economic weakness, its lack of indigenous raw materials within the empire. That was the way in which you could control and contain Japan if you wish to do so. Um, and by 1939, this is absolutely central to the way in which the Foreign Office operates. And one of the reasons they know it's so important is they're reading the BJs, they're reading the intercepts, and the Japanese reveal in their communications their concern about raw materials, and the British say, yeah, got them. Now we know how to push their buttons. But in addition, beyond looking at the FO37, the Far Eastern Department material on that, it was also possible to go beyond what uh, Peter had written about economic sanctions by looking at the documents, not just of the Far Eastern Department, but also going into the Western Department and the American Department as well. Um, it was actually the Western Department of the Foreign Office that controlled economic sanctions policy, not the Far Eastern Department. So if you want to know what policy was, you had to go to the Western Department. And when you went there, you would see how this policy of economic sanctions um, fitted into an overall concept of the economic blockade of the Axis powers and of Japan. Um, I was therefore able, I think, to show more than my predecessors that before July 1941, the British Empire already had an extensive blockade policy. And this policy was not based on the idea of moral sanctions, a slap on the wrist for Japan for naughty behavior. This was a policy of economic warfare. It was designed to reduce Japan's capacity to go to war. It even involved some element of oil sanctions. They said to the Japanese, if you want oil from the Middle East, we haven't got any oil drums, we haven't got any tankers spare, you're going to have to do it yourself. And the obvious implication is that the Japanese didn't have the capability. So there is an oil sanction, but it's all defended on the basis that this is needed for the British war effort. The last thing, and the most surprising single moment I had in the archives, was um, when in February 1941, Lord Halifax, the British, Ambassador in the United States meets with Sumner Wells, the Deputy Secretary of State, and uh, he says, Halifax says, we're going to have to put a blockade on uh, the Japanese transshipping material from Brazil to Japan, to Russia, Trans-Siberian Railway, to Germany. And we're going to have to introduce a blockade in Jamaica, thus infringing Western Hemisphere neutrality. And Wells says, oh, there's no need to go ahead with that. We've decided to deal with this problem. We're going to buy Latin America. And what they mean is going into the Latin American market and every uh, piece of Chilean copper, every piece of Brazilian rubber will be bought for the American war effort and they can afford it. And it was just like, wow. This is the power of the rising uh, country in the world. In the conclusion of the book, I argued for the significance of Britain's role in the war 
uh, in the road to the Pacific War, and um, argued that the focus on the United States that had dominated the literature was really inadequate. In addition, I stated it was difficult to see any separate path to the one that ended in conflict. I ascribe this to a number of factors. The fact that it, this was a global crisis. This is not just a confrontation between Japan and Britain and the United States. It is part of a global war between the tripartite alliance um, and the uh, British, the Americans, and the Soviet Union. I emphasize the importance of the United States to Britain. That if Britain had to choose between Japan and the United States, this was not a choice. This was always going to be Britain coming down um, to choose America as its ally. That was far more important than keeping Japan neutral. In addition, I made clear from the uh, way in which politics works in Britain that I didn't think it was ever possible for Britain to seriously make economic concessions to Japan. Although I did criticize Britain for its inflexibility over the need to adapt the status quo to the changing world, I did say that I thought short-termism had led to a long-term disaster, although I said I could understand that. The, uh, the truth of the matter was that you could see an inability to provide real leadership on these trade issues in the 1930s had had extremely unfortunate long-term consequences. Um, the book's reviews and citations, I'm glad to say, have been generally favourable. The one area of contention has really been over this whole idea of economic appeasement. Um, John Ferris, who reviewed the book for the American Historical Review, liked a lot of it, but he didn't like my saying that perhaps if Japan had been offered a free trade uh, road, that perhaps uh, another path might have been followed. Um, Andrew Crozier, a historian at um, Queen Mary's College, however, very much liked the uh, concentration on economic appeasement and tried to use that in discussing Anglo-German relations. Well, you can't please everybody, but I thought it was an extremely interesting area um, to open up. So that's what the book did. How would I write the book now? What do I think of it in retrospect? Generally, I still hold to the same views. Um, I wouldn't change the general tenor of the book, the general argument of the book, um, but I am a different historian now to what I was then, and there are areas that I would address now in much greater detail. Obviously, it goes without saying that intelligence is part of that. I wrote the second book. I thought there was enough to say about intelligence gathering to argue uh, another book that would actually cover part of the same period. And what I did in that second book was, in regard to the period of the first book, was to try and outline more fully why Britain viewed Japan as unappeasable, and how by late 1940 it saw Japan as essentially an undeclared full ally of the Axis. Um, and here, the important things were how intelligence gathering had created an image of Japan as an essentially cautious power and a power that was weak militarily. After all, if they can't beat China, who can they beat? Um, in addition, I was interested to find uh, evidence that from the autumn of 1940, Britain was aware that the Japanese representatives in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Iraq, were passing intelligence on to the Axis powers about British force dispositions. And that is something where you suddenly think, well, why would you actually want to appease a country? Which is not only signed the Tripartite Pact, but it, this demonstrates the Tripartite Pact is not, as some have argued, um, a rather abstract concern that didn't really matter. This was absolutely central to Japanese policy, and it was being the intelligence parts of that alliance were being carried out in practice, and the British knew it. And what's more, they passed this stuff on to the Americans. Um, so it clearly means Japan is on the wrong side of the global crisis as far as the West is concerned. But beyond that, historiography. Um, those who know me well will know that I'm not exactly the greatest fan of conceptual approaches to history. Um, approaches to history that see all history, history as historiography bore me to tears. 
Um, but there would be more I would want to say about historiography. In particular, when I was researching this book, I hadn't really dealt with Japanese secondary sources. Um, I became aware, large part due to the Anglo-Japanese History Project, of just how uh, complete the influence was in Japan of the view that Britain had appeased Japan in the 1930s. And I saw this repeated in article and book after book after book, and I thought, what? Where does this come from? This simply isn't the case as far as I can see. Um, what they're seeing is that some elements within the British government want to appease, and they're imagining that this is everyone. Well, it's not. It's only one group, and that group often don't get their way. And often when they're actually arguing about appeasement, what they're suggesting is another department of state. It's their responsibility to appease Japan. So the Treasury isn't talking about um, trade concessions. They're talking about naval arms limitation concessions. The Navy and War Office talk about trade concessions. So there's not actually a concerted policy on this. Appeasement never comes to fruition, apart from on very small short-term occasions. So I would have tackled that in greater detail um, and argue that I think it is a misinterpretation. What else? Um, beyond Whitehall, I've got as my little um, bullet point number two here. The book was very focused on the interaction between government ministries in Whitehall and its representatives overseas. It was an orthodox work of international history. Since then, my methodology has changed. Um, I'm now much more interested in looking at how British society, particularly elite society, because it's easier to read than public opinion as a whole, perceived and interacted with Japan. If I was writing the book today, I would be looking at the role of, in particular, three key lobbying groups. I would look at the left in Britain. I would look at the uh, policy of the Labour Party, the TUC, their reaction to the Sino-Japanese War, the China Campaign Committee, something that's recently been studied by Tom Buchanan in a book for OUP. I think that is extremely interesting, and I remember uh, Ian at one stage giving me sight of the, uh, I think it was the book that Mrs. Yoshida had written um, yeah. about their time in London, yeah, and used. the discussion of demonstrations outside the embassy. And these demonstrations are left-wing demonstrations. And there's a very interesting history. Um, which again shows the way in which Japan is not treated in isolation. The same people who are involved in campaigning against the Spanish Civil War are campaigning against um, Japan's involvement in China. Um, and indeed, Japanese bombing of Chinese cities in the autumn of 1937, that resonates. It's the year of Guernica. It's quite clear it's going to resonate. Um, so one thing would be to look at that and the influence of this on the government. Um, I've also been looking at uh, various records to do with the Church of England and missionary groups. Um, there's been some very interesting work on uh, the Church of England and the 1930s. There's a fantastic article, I think it's by somebody called Chandler, on the Church of England and appeasement, and looking at bishops' records in particular and their communications with the political elite. Um, some work in this field on Japan has been done by Hamish Iron, but I think it's possible to go even further with it. So I would include that. Um, most important, and there is a recent article by a young historian called Jamie Perry on this, is the reaction of the China lobby, that is business, to the conflict in China. And here what I found is there's an absolute wealth of material that I didn't use which I should have used, um, and which I will be using um, for a forthcoming edited book where I've been asked to do a chapter on the period between 37 and 39. It's an edited book on the links between Whitehall and business and foreign policy. Um, we have not just the papers of the Treasury, the Bank of England, one of the great underutilized archives, wonderful stuff. Um, but we also have Jardin Matheson, 
Federation of British Industry, London Chamber of Commerce, Squires, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, all of this presents a very important input into debate about how to interact with Japan, particularly in 37, 38. And in a sense, it's a parallel, but also a history that sometimes flows into what's going on in Whitehall. Um, in the summer of 1938, what HSBC think about loaning money to China is absolutely vital to British policy. And HSBC are the most loath to lend the money. They are the most reactionary of all of the commercial firms operating in China, with Swires way ahead of them in progressive thinking. Um, that's, in a way, that also feeds into another area where I've been doing a lot of research, which is on Parliament, the media, and to a degree the in intelligentsia. Um, not that I am in any way an intellectual historian at all. Um, I think I fell into the international history trap of putting too much emphasis on the opinion of civil servants. That, uh, you know, what civil servants write is marvellous to quote. Um, it's very persuasive, it's very well written. They don't make policy though, do they? Politicians make policy. And politicians make policy depending on the political environment. And the political environment is shaped by a number of things. I have been amazed at how little Parliament is used as a source by international historians, particularly uh, historians of British foreign policy. The debates are fascinating. <coughs> the debates show a level of expertise in these areas that is quite astonishing. They also show the way in which ideas transmit very rapidly from the intellectual world into the political world. Um, and I think that's, that's an extremely important area, very largely because it constrains the Foreign Office. There are limits that politicians set on policy, because they know if they go beyond that, they're going to get into serious difficulty in Parliament. Um, and I think you can see this. If there is no, there's not going to be any appeasement of Japan, because simply Parliament's not going to stand for it. Um, and it's, that seems to me quite clear. In addition, the media. Um, I didn't really sort of understand how international historians were supposed to use the media. Mm -hmm. It always seemed to be just sort of there'd be a reference in, in books that said, I've used the Times, but it didn't seem to be very thorough. Um, and I've gone down that road much more in what uh, the work I've been doing recently. Um, and in there, it's not simply looking at the newspapers. It's going beyond the print and going into the archives of the newspapers themselves and going to look at the private papers of journalists and editors and seeing how editorial policy is made. And that is a fascinating process um, and something that I, I would have put in to the book um, had I thought of it at the time. What else? Intellectuals, as I say, you have a number of uh, people, in particular, those who are beginning to frame the discipline of international relations. Um, people um, like Charles Webster, his papers are at the LSE. Um, you have uh, Toynbee at Oxford. Um, you have Lionel Curtis. You have many figures who are interested in current international relations and comment on it because they want to see how their abstract ideas play in reality. And they create an intellectual environment um, that's extremely <coughs> interesting. And beyond that, I was absolutely amazed about three years ago when I went to Chatham House. Um, now you may think, you may know this already, but I was amazed. You may think that all of the, the talks at Chatham House are produced in international affairs. Oh, no, 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 no. They're probably about a third, maybe even half of the talks, do not have their records published. All that is left are fairly flimsy copies of the lecture and the Q&A that take place at Chatham House. It's kept in their archive. And it is an absolutely fascinating source, because first of all, you have an intellectual or a politician expressing their views on East Asia, 
But then you have a learned audience discussing those views. And those were an extremely valuable source. In other words, if I wrote the book now, it would not be about 102,000 words, it would probably be about 250,000 words. Um, and nobody would want to publish it. But, never mind. Um, it would be a much richer book, um, and a more interesting one. Um, and that then leads on to, uh, as Ian said, um, this is what is influencing the volume I'm just working on. You may think that I've been incredibly lazy. The last book was published in 2003. And I've been swanning around, sort of eating sandwiches and having drinks ever since. Um, well, no, I have been wrestling with a book. Um, it doesn't just end in 1975, Ian. It begins in 1854. Um, and that's why you've not seen it yet. Um, this is a long period of time. And what I've been doing is trying to merge my old methodology with my new methodology to try to create an, uh, an overview of how Britain perceived and interacted with Japan over that huge period of time. In my last sabbatical, I wrote about half of it. Um, and then the sabbatical ended, and as those who are academics will know, well, that's the end of the book until the next one. Um, you may be glad to hear that I have a term-long sabbatical um, for Michaelmas term, that's October to December um, next, or this, this coming uh, academic year. Um, in part, this is because I'm going to be 50, um, and as anyone who knows me well, uh, my wife is in Japan, I do not want to spend my 50th birthday by myself. Um, so I decided to use my sabbatical leave wisely to spend my sabbatical and my birthday with Saho in Japan, but also to commit myself to writing, finishing the rest of this volume, which will end in 1975, which is the year when, for the first time, a reigning British monarch visits Japan. Queen Elizabeth II is the first reigning monarch to visit. Um, that is the end point, because to me, the history of 1945 to 1975 in Anglo-Japanese relations is not Anglo-Japanese relations and the Cold War so much. It's how do you normalize relations after the horrors of the Pacific War. Um, how do you manage to normalize relations when you can see the influence of the memory of uh, the war crimes that were committed in that period um, being enhanced by British anger about the production of cheap Japanese textiles pushing Lancashire out of business, the ferocity of opposition in the northwest of Japan in the 1950s is a far more noticeable uh, and substantial feeling um, than any concern of Japan being seen as a Cold War ally. It's only, the Cold, it's only the Foreign Office who see Japan as a Cold War ally. And they have to push and push and push for the Prime Minister even to recognize this as important. Macmillan was supposed to go to Japan in 1961 and 1962. He cancelled on both occasions because he had more important things to think about. In other words, he didn't want to go. He didn't want to be associated with Japan. So that is the story that I'm telling, where I see 1975 as the event that demonstrates that finally these relations have returned not just to normality, they return to normality in the early 60s. This is when they actually have at least an element of warmth in them again. It's not 71, it's certainly not Hirohito's visit to the UK, which was a bit of a disaster. Um, the archives increasingly making it clear just how much of a disaster it was. So anyway, that is why it is going to be 75. Um, it may be 75 years until I finish the damn thing, but anyway, um, we will see. Um, hopefully not. Um, keep an eye out. You never know that if I were kind enough, there may be a book launch 2016 sometime. I don't promise, but you never know. Thank you very much.